Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Sal, and this is another Expedition Log. On today's Halloween-fueled expedition, we'll be exploring Atlantic City in New Jersey and its Dead Mall. Existing once as the mecca of gambling in the mid-Atlantic states, six casinos have shuttered since 2014, leaving Atlantic City as an exiguous boardwalk empire. Its mall has survived for 113 years to this date, despite rampant vacancies and multiple catastrophic structural failures. So come take a walk with me and my trusty sidekick Anthony from Faded Commerce through Atlantic City, New Jersey and the Playground Pier Mall. But first, a word from our sponsor. Today we have a double feature. Trailers from Todd Browning's horror masterpieces Dracula and Freaks from 1931 and 1932 respectively. Happy Halloween, guys. I am Dracula. Listen to them. Children of the night. What music they make. Why, he's mad. Look at his eye. Why, the man's gone crazy. I have eyes for only one woman. The woman I asked to be my wife. Tomorrow night, we got something new. I can do anything with that, Ralph. To me, you're a man. But to her, you're only something to laugh at. Love them laugh. They're swine. You. Well, here's something for your eye.
The history of Atlantic City is incredibly deep and it goes back pretty far and it's not just about casinos and gambling and the debauchery of the Nucky Johnson Prohibition era. There's a lot of history to this and if you guys don't mind I'd like to tell you about some of those things starting from the very beginning. In the late 1670s, Thomas Budd arrived in Atlantic County, New Jersey after being given the Apsecan Island, which is modern day Atlantic City, and he got additional acreage as settlement against holders of the Royal Grant. At this time, his mainland property was valued at roughly 40 cents an acre, while the island beach property was valued at a mere 4 cents per acre. In the years before Thomas Budd, however, the original inhabitants of Ebsecan Island were the Lenni Lenape Indians. They would travel across the old Indian trail from the mainland to access the island, and they would spend the warm summer months on the beach. The rich abundance of flora and wildlife and seafood in both the ocean and bay would provide the Lenape people with all they needed to thrive. These Algonquin-speaking people would name the island Abzigami, which means little water, which is a term that they used for the bay because of its significance to the larger body of water, the Atlantic Ocean, directly across from it. Over time, the word Abzigami was transformed into Absecan, as we know it today. And for the next hundred years, not only would the Lenape visit the island, but also mainland hunters and settlers. And in the mid-1780s, the first year-round residence was built on the island by Jeremiah Leeds on what is now Arctic and Arkansas Avenue. This area that we're walking around right now, this is all part of that now abandoned Trump Plaza complex. And I'll get into all the details of that a bit later in the episode, because we'll do everything sequentially. But make sure that you have a keen eye and that you really look for the details here, because there's some pretty gross stuff that can really pop out at you. And furthermore, if any of you have ever stayed at these places, any of these places that I'm about to visit that you'll see in this episode, let me know in the comments because I'd love to hear about it in its glory days, when it was thriving. The Leed family were the first residents of Absecan Island where they would grow corn and rye and raise cattle on the Leeds plantation. Jeremiah died in 1838 and his second wife, Millicent, opened the first business on the island, Aunt Millie's Boarding House, which was located where Baltic and Massachusetts Avenue are today. Into the mid-1850s, the population of the Leeds descendants on the island was growing but there was one man who owned property on the island outside of the Leeds family. Dr. Jonathan Pitney was a physician living in Absecan who wanted to create a health resort on the island, but he had to overcome the difficult and strenuous voyage to the proposed resort. Pitney reached out to Richard Osborne, who was a civil engineer from Philadelphia, who would ultimately bring railroad access to the island. A new rail system began construction in 1852, which Osborne named the Camden Atlantic City Railroad. During the railroad construction, the first hotel would open. In 1853, the Bellow House opened to guests on Massachusetts and Atlantic Avenue. The casino that we're about to go into is part of the Bally's Casino, but it's an expansion that they put onto the casino in 1997, which is the Wild Wild West Casino. And as you can see, when I'm walking around outside here, I didn't even think this place was open. There's just trash littered all over the place, and I expect tumbleweeds to float by. So in a second, we'll go inside here and take a brief tour. And also, I'd like to mention that once we go in here to the Bally's, to the Wild Wild West Casino, you can walk directly into the Bally's, you can transfer to the Caesars Casino, which we'll go to after that, and directly from the Caesars, you can walk to the Playground Pier Mall. And you never have to leave the confines of the indoors to transfer to each of these places, which I thought was pretty cool. For the purposes of this expedition, I do leave the Caesars to go around the back entrance to the Playground Pier, and we'll get a few shots of the abandoned Trump Plaza in the meantime when we do go over there.
The mass influx of tourists would begin, however, on July 5th, 1854, with rail service from Camden directly to the island. It was at this point that the Absecon Island would become known by locals as the Atlantic City, with credit given to Mr. Osborne for the name. Dr. Pitney would devise the street names, with streets running parallel to the ocean named after bodies of water around the Earth, you know, Pacific, Arctic, Baltic, Adriatic, etc. And the streets running perpendicular to the Atlantic Ocean would be named after the United States of America. And if you've ever played the board game Monopoly, the properties in the game were drawn directly from locations around Atlantic City, New Jersey. The island would develop and expand quickly in the coming years, including the rise of illegal gambling. The first road from the mainland to the island was completed in 1870, carrying a 30 cent toll. As more and more hotels, restaurants, and attractions were constantly being built on the island, there was no barrier for the barrage of sand blowing around constantly getting into everything. It got into clothes, food, hotel lobbies, everything. So in the early 1870s, an eight foot wide boardwalk was constructed to give tourists an easier path to get between attractions and also a barrier to prevent sand from getting everywhere. The amount of visitors to the island was growing so steadily that the single railway from Camden just wasn't enough. And in 1878, the narrow gauge line to Philadelphia was built. In the next two years, the existing boardwalk was removed and replaced with a much larger, safer walkway for tourists, completed in the winter of 1880. Then on Wednesday, June 16, 1880, Atlantic City was formally dedicated, opening with incredible pomp, with gigantic hotels adorned with lush amenities lining the streets. Now, also keep in mind, everything was by candlelight up until 1882 and the first bit of electricity wouldn't flow to the island until the first electric streetlight was installed in July of 1882. However, in 1889, a catastrophic hurricane struck the island. The degree of damage was incredible, and most of the boardwalk was destroyed, leaving the city under six feet of water. And it was due to this storm that the city officials now have a 60-foot wide boardwalk with numerous safety features in place, rather than the 8 to 10-foot wide boardwalk that existed back then. Traversing the 1900s, Atlantic City was quickly rebuilt and would enter its golden age of entertainment and debauchery. On July 26, 1906, Captain John L. Young built the 1,700-foot-long Million Dollar Pier. It was built by the Perini Building Company of Framingham, Massachusetts, and home to what they build as, quote, the world's largest ballroom. It had the Hippodrome Theater, Exhibit Hall, a Greek temple, an aquarium, and a roller skating rink. Captain Young even built himself a mansion on the pier, and gave himself the address of One Atlantic Ocean. As the city grew, so too did political corruption. And by 1911, Enoch Lewis Johnson, affectionately referred to as Nucky, would avoid corruption charges and would replace political boss Lewis Quennell as the new political machine of Atlantic City, New Jersey. Nucky served as the sheriff for four years before he gained this position. Understanding that Atlantic City was a tourist destination, Nucky wanted to give the people what they wanted, and at the time, the people wanted to drink and gamble while seeking adult companionship in the form of professionally hired love accompanists. So, Nucky allowed the sale of booze on Sundays, along with gambling and legal prostitution, in exchange for a vig from political enablers. He got a kickback for all of these profits. Tourists would come from all over the world to see world-famous acts of vaudeville debauchery, to drink 24-7, to gamble to their heart's content, run booze directly onto the shore of the beach, and to share the airspace of both hired love and Hollywood fame. However, in the winter, the city would always grow silent. 
and between 1919 and 1920, the city nearly shut down due to countrywide prohibition enforcement. Naki decided, though, that prohibition was a bad idea, and that Atlantic City just shouldn't enforce it. So using his political influence and power, he made sure that speakeasies and gambling halls could operate as long as they kicked back cash directly to his pockets. This is how he made most of his money, and for his efforts, he made lots of it. He would host lavish parties at his suite in the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, wearing his trademark red carnation on the lapel of extremely expensive suits pulling up to the hotel in very expensive limousines. It was during this time that Atlantic City would become known as the world's playground, and Nucky was once quoted saying, quote, We have whiskey, wine, women, song, and slot machines. I won't deny it, and I won't apologize for it. Close quote. But their winter months, as always, were still dead. Nobody came to Atlantic City in the winter. However, on September 25th, 1920, an event called the Fall Frolic was designed to keep summer tourists in the city past Labor Day and formed the roots of the Miss America pageant. And on September 6th, 1924, the fourth annual Miss America pageant was held at the Million Dollar Pier. The pageant would run consistently in Atlantic City for the next 80 years, except between the years of 1928 and 1932 during the Great Depression, at which time officials cited concerns that the competition was promoting, quote, loose morals. Backed by an established history of the entire city literally promoting and encouraging loose morals. So it was probably a good idea to cool it for those years. In an effort to bring more business to the island through the winter months, the Atlantic City Convention Hall was built in 1929 and would sponsor year-round conventions of various topics, including the 1929 Atlantic City Conference, which hosted numerous organized crime leaders, including Al Capone. The local economy was also supported by a robust bootleg liquor industry, where they would just drive the booze right up onto the shore and offload it from the boat. Nobody cared. As the Great Depression ended, the Million Dollar Pier was purchased by local circus owner and clown entrepreneur George Hammond. He would own and operate the pier for the next few decades, including the Steel Pier. The Miss America pageant returned in 1933, but 1933 a 15-year-old won, and that caused some issues. So rules were put in place to limit contestants to the ages of 18 to 26, and Lenora Slaughter was selected as the new director for the program. They needed to put some constraints on this program because it wasn't cool that these young girls were winning and the city had enough problems hiding their debauched nature. Prohibition was also repealed in 1933 and because of this it extinguished much of the appeal that Atlantic City had to offer to tourists as they could just get their booze without traveling to the island now. Monopoly, the board game, was introduced by Parker Brothers in February of 1935 and once again that game drew its locations from Atlantic City. We are currently in the Playground Pier Mall. This mall consists of four total floors. The first floor is accessible via the boardwalk entrance. That includes some random shops, like a jewelry shop that's still open, and then towards the middle there's this bar area. And the second floor, that's accessible directly via the Caesars Casino. As you saw, we walked right in from the casino floor. The second floor used to be comprised of shops and there's just nothing there anymore. There's maybe one shop open and it's mostly vacant. Now the third floor, that has a Phillips seafood restaurant along with another restaurant that I couldn't see the name of, but it has this really unique viewing area. And they intended during one of the redesigns to make it feel like you were just sitting on the beach. They put sand in the little areas with beach chairs and you have direct view with gigantic windows of the ocean. 
which is a really cool touch and it's a great place to relax. The third floor also has access to the back deck where you can go out and actually see the ocean, but it was locked when I was here. And directly adjacent of these windows at the back of the mall, there's an entrance to what used to be the area where the fountain show was that actually used to contain a bunch more shops. But that area has since been closed down and there's somebody sitting there constantly guarding it so that you can't get in. Now there is a fourth floor, but it's limited to events, weddings and parties and stuff like that, which we weren't able to see because there were events happening every time that I was here. During World War II, Atlantic City was both a training site for active military, as well as a rehab center for wounded soldiers. The military presence brought a positive note to the jazz bars, nightlife, theaters, and streets all throughout. And then in 1941, Nucky Johnson was indicted on tax evasion charges, and he would begin his 10-year prison sentence, only serving five of those years and getting paroled in 1945. Nucky lived the rest of his life pretty quietly, and he died at his home of natural causes on December 9, 1968. This used to be the food court, and obviously it's closed down, and it's been closed down for quite some time now. I never had the opportunity to eat there, and if any of you have, let me know in the comments. Let me know if it was any good. The hallway that we're in right now used to lead directly to the section that the fountain show was at. But as you can see, it's completely boarded off now and you can't get through. And as you'll learn later, the fountains were removed. So there's nothing to see in that hallway. It's just completely empty. But we do get a look at that hallway a little later in the episode. I'll show you from the outside what it looks like. The 45th President of the United States of America, Donald John Trump, would enter the Atlantic City Resort Casino scene in 1982. Under the Trump Organization, they were paid to build the Harrah's at Trump Plaza on behalf of and funded by the owners at the time, Holiday Inns. Trump provided the land and construction costs after beginning a long string of taking out incredibly high interest loans which he would often avoid repaying. For his efforts in building Harrah's, he would receive an equal profit share, and he was protected against operational losses for the casino's first five years of business. In his book, The Art of the Deal, Donald Trump wrote how he would have his construction company excavate dirt and then refill a hole with more dirt in order just to fool his partners into thinking that more work was being done on the site than they were actually doing. And then the casino opened on May 15, 1984 at a cost of $210 million. Using his business influence at the time, Trump convinced his partners to remove the word Harrah's from the name of the casino just five months after opening, and they renamed the property 
Trump Plaza. Two years later, Trump purchased the property from Holiday Inns and renamed the property to Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino. Back when the very first iPad Pro was released, there was an Apple store in this very hallway, and this is where I purchased that iPad Pro. But you don't see an Apple store here anymore, and this is one of the very few Apple stores in the country that closed without the intent to relocate to anywhere in the premises. At the end of World War II, and with air travel becoming more prevalent to more exotic locations throughout the 50s and 60s, tourism to Atlantic City would decline dramatically. There was nothing to draw tourism to the city. Nucky was dead, so he wasn't around anymore to protect illegal gambling and all the debauched things that people used to travel to Atlantic City for. However, in 1976, A referendum was passed by a super narrow margin of 1.5 million votes for and 1.14 million votes against to legalize casinos in New Jersey, but limited solely to the confines of Atlantic City, which made Atlantic City the only place outside of the state of Nevada where one could legally gamble. Needless to say, this was a huge opportunity for those looking to invest in casinos. And the first casino was opened in 1978, which was the Resorts Atlantic City International. The second casino was the Caesars, opening on June 26, 1979, of which this mall that we're in right now is directly attached to. The third casino to open was Bally's, which opened on December 29, 1979, which was the Old West-themed casino we were in a bit earlier in the episode. In 1981, a fire broke out and destroyed part of the pier that we're walking in right now. So the entire existing structure was torn down, and in 1983, the 900-foot-long Ocean One shopping mall was dedicated to complement Caesars Casino as its premier shopping experience. In 1985, Hilton Hotels were nearly finished building their brand new casino in the Marina District of Atlantic City but at the last moment they were denied a gambling license from the state of New Jersey due to allegations of their dealings in organized crime. So naturally, Trump swept in and he purchased the property in an all-cash offer, of which the details were disclosed by neither Trump nor Hilton at the time, but years later it was finally revealed to be about $320 million. Once the casino finally opened, they opened it with the name Trump Castle. This was Trump's little beach castle. This corridor also leads down to that section that used to have the fountain show. And as you can see here, when I zoom in, there are glass doors that are blocking that off, among a few other barricades. So even if I were to hop even one of those, I wouldn't get very far. And I wouldn't be able to show you much over there anyway. So I didn't even take the chance. But again, just stay tuned because later we do go around the back outside onto the pier and we get to look in to see what that looks like. While on a huge roll of swooping in and purchasing semi-finished properties at a bigly discounted rate, Mr. Trump tried to purchase the entire Taj Mahal company. The whole thing. All of their casinos, all of their hotels. But he lost to the talk show host, Merv Griffin, who ultimately won the rights to the company. Trump, 
who settled to be a partner in the deal, acquired the Atlantic City Taj Mahal from Resorts International for $230 million. However, it was unfinished, and there was a lot of work yet to be done. So he put up about $600 million in capital, but the total project was about $1.2 billion. So Trump issued $675 million worth of junk bonds at a 14% interest rate just to gain the capital. Now, this was a really risky move because at the time, interest rates were all over the place. So there was no telling what would actually happen to these bonds in the long term. Regardless, Trump got his capital and they finished the Trump Taj Mahal, which Trump dubbed the eighth wonder of the world. And this was opened in 1990. Now, at the time, Trump definitely had a command of Atlantic City and he owned nearly a third of all of the gambling revenue, and he employed about 8,000 people. But because he was buying all of these unfinished properties and getting loan after loan after loan and issuing junk bond after junk bond, he was leaving a wake of banks and small business owners in his dust. And they were losing a ton of money, but he was getting a lot of money personally from it. Could be a smart business move to get a lot of money for yourself, but in the long term of things, it's a really, really bad move for the community. The local community really didn't like what he was doing during this time. The opening of the Trump Taj Mahal brought the total number of casinos in Atlantic City to 12. And from annual reported foot traffic of about 700,000 tourists in 1978, Atlantic City would see over 35 million people in 1991 alone. Business was doing okay. Tourism industry was doing okay. And at the turn of the millennium, Atlantic City would have a tax base of an astounding $6.7 billion. Contrasted against the base in 1976 was at a paltry $316 million. In the early aughts, the gaming industry was struggling through a recession. The interest rates were wildly, wildly unmanageable and sporadic. And junk bonds were exactly that. They were junk. They were tanking. So the Trump Entertainment Resorts Company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection just one year after the Trump Taj Mahal was opened when they were unable to make their payments and they owed about $900 million in back payments. This hit Trump pretty hard and he had to sell his private yacht and his plane to help offset the losses, while his creditors put him on a salary of a measly $5.4 million a year. And then by 1991, straddled with nearly $5 billion in total company-wide debt, that includes his casinos, his hotels, all of his business ventures, the Trump organization was straddled with $5 billion in company-wide debt. They missed an interest payment of $18.4 million for Trump's castle. So Trump directed his father, Fred, to send a lawyer to Trump's castle to purchase $3.3 million of casino chips to provide an infusion of cash. This was definitely illegal, and it failed. And they were fined $65,000 for what they did, which was just a drop in the bucket for them. And by 1992, all three Trump-owned casinos in Atlantic City were in bankruptcy court and the lenders took 50% of the properties in exchange for giving Trump lower interest rates. And by 1996, Trump consolidated the properties into Trump hotels and casino resorts. And Trump sold his interest in the casinos to his own company to make about a million dollars in cash and gaining $130 million worth of stocks. But again, there was still about $5 billion in total debt. So that was a pretty small step up that mountain. So right now we're looking at the back end of the Playground Pier Mall. This is the area that was closed off to the public when I went, but I just took the, the service way that the trams usually go around. We're gonna take a look inside here where the old fountain show used to be. And you'll see the giant round corridor where all the shops used to be and the intertwining escalators. It was a very, very cool area. And we'll get a little bit clearer of a picture in a second that you can see the center of this area. But there were shops that lined the entire circular corridor. And that fountain show is incredible. It ran on the hour with Bellagio-esque fountains and incredible lighting. And I did have the opportunity to see that fountain show 
a while ago, I stayed at Caesars, it was before 2010. It really was an incredible show. And if you look on YouTube, just search for Playground Pier Fountain Show, you'll find something. You'll see what it used to look like. In 2002, Gordon Group Holdings, the current owners of the Ocean One Mall, completely demolished the existing structure. And in 2003, the brand new Pier at Caesars was formally dedicated. There were ultra-luxury shopping options here, such as Apple, Gucci, Armani, Louis Vuitton, and this is when the now defunct Fountain Show was introduced at the far end of the mall, which faced directly out to the ocean. The following year, in 2004, celebrations were held across the island to celebrate Atlantic City's 150th anniversary. However, as both a blessing and a blow to the retail at the pier, a factory outlet was opened just blocks away called The Walk. That's now the Tangier Outlets. Also in 2004, Trump filed bankruptcy yet again, with $1.8 billion in casino debt alone. So he walked out of court, now with 28% share in the company. Just five years later, in 2009, Trump filed for bankruptcy yet again, with their casino debt whittled down to a measly $1.2 billion. So they struck a deal with the Beal Bank and Carl E. Kahn to let Trump continue using his name on their hotel casinos, but for a less share in the company, which he now had a 10% stake in. In 2010, the pier at casinos was owned by the Taubman Centers, but they defaulted on their $135 million loan from C3 Capital Partners, who would assume ownership of this property moving forward. And for the record, C3 Capital Partners has no relation to the late, great, blessed Century 3 Mall. Press F to pay respects to Century 3 in the comments. In October of 2012, Hurricane Sandy devastated New Jersey. With at least 37 fatalities, and nearly $30 billion worth of damage. And even though the hurricane made landfall directly over Atlantic City, the damages weren't as catastrophic as the hurricane that struck in 1889. Now, one could probably argue that the structural integrity of these places was a lot weaker back in 1889. But notwithstanding, Atlantic City came out of that hurricane pretty well intact. One year prior to this though, in 2011, the Trump Marina was sold to Landry's Restaurants for $38 million. And in 2013, the Trump Plaza was sold for $20 million to the Meruelo Group, based out of California. Soured by his ultra-elite perfect name, adorning these now unworthy hotels, Trump successfully sued for his name to be removed from them in August of 2014. One month later, Trump filed for bankruptcy yet again, and Trump Plaza was closed for good. And the following year in 2015, the Pier at Caesars was rebranded to Playground Pier as a subtle callback to the days of Nucky Johnson, to the days of Nucky's political rule, and seemingly a desperate attempt to elicit that feeling of Atlantic City still being, quote, the world's playground. It wasn't. It's not still the world's playground. That ended in the 40s. It's actually pretty rough right now. During this transition, that's when they removed the fountain, and that's when they also began hemorrhaging retailers. So now we're walking around the abandoned Trump Plaza. And I thought that it was important to give the entire history of Trump's dealings in casinos in Atlantic City, because he did attempt to create an empire in Atlantic City with his casinos. And despite that failing, it's still an important part of this city's history because he owned a ton of the gambling revenue and he created a lot of jobs. But the downside is lots of jobs were lost when his casinos ultimately failed. 
but I do think that it's fascinating that there's still power on at these places. And when I was looking inside, you can still see security guards inside, so there's a constant security presence and they're protecting these properties very closely. But the visual aesthetics on the outside of this place are fascinating to me. And I would have loved to see the inside, but again, there's a pretty big security presence and I would never take that chance. In February 2016, Trump Entertainment Resorts exited bankruptcy when Carl Econ bailed the company out, absorbing Trump into Econ Enterprises. But later that year, Trump's last operating property in Atlantic City, the Taj Mahal, closed its doors on October 10th, 2016. The abandoned Trump Plaza has been scheduled for demolition twice, but each time the deadline for demolition has passed. The property is in horrible disrepair though, and bits seem to fall off the building as time marches on. Now the financial trouble extends well past Trump, as between 2014 and 2019, six casinos have shuttered across Atlantic City. But despite these troubling times, the Playground Pier continues to march on time and time again as it remains the immortal dead mall of the Atlantic Ocean, burned to a crisp and rebuilt. Virtually nothing remaining inside. But you're free to walk nearly the entirety of it. And it's a fantastic structure and I don't see it closing anytime soon. As far as the casinos, they have a bit of work to do. I'd really like to thank all of you for sticking through this episode and watching it. Because I've had this episode planned for quite a while, and I've wanted to do this city profile slash dead mall adventure like I did in Chambersburg, like I did at Ocean City, Maryland. And if you like this kind of stuff, please let me know in the comments. And if you're not too stoked by it, also let me know. Because I surely don't want to give you guys content that you don't like. But at the same time, I would like to experiment and to try different formats. And along with that, I also don't know how YouTube's algorithm is really working these days. And I've had a lot of reports of people not getting notifications for my videos. But it would behoove all of you to follow me on social media, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, to make sure you join the Discord. All of those links are down in the description below and you can chat with me through most of the day. I appreciate all of you guys watching, and I want to send a, a special shout out to all of my patrons who help fund these expeditions directly. So you guys, you guys really rock. And to the Dead Malls of Discord family, you guys rock too. And to the entire legion of explorers and quite studios out there, thank you guys so much for helping my channel to get to this point that we're at today. So thanks again everybody. Take care and have a fantastic day.